talk about something that's been up for me over the last month or so. And that is, how do we get from the idea of a single, universal, absolute truth that drives a large part of religion and science how do we get from that to, well, if you look at the world, a huge number of different cults and sects and denominations and religions and spiritual paths and scientific fields and blah, blah, on and on and on. And almost all of them claim to have the truth which of course implies that all the others are wrong. <laughs> so of course, we're well acquainted with the phenomenon of reductionism from science. Science wants to tell simple stories that explain everything. <laughs> Even Einstein once said, it has to be simple, as simple as possible, but not too simple, <laughs> because it still has to explain the facts. But actually, well, I'm going to lose a lot of you here. Scientism <laughs> is more of a religion than most religions, <laughs> because it uses inductive reasoning to project truths into areas that are actually unknown and claim that it knows, but it really doesn't. So we have to take all scientific claims with a grain of salt, huh? maybe a, a tablespoon of salt. <laughs> but you know, religion, can be just as speculative as science. What is religion really based on? One of the things that's common to almost all, if not all, religious and spiritual paths is the idea of a destination, a perfection of some kind, a realm or a state of no suffering, no anxiety, and so on. A paradise, in other words. So all religions posit some kind of destination, except for one that I know of, and that's uh, shamanism. Shamanism says, no, actually, uh, there is no final or ultimate state. Things just keep going on and keep changing. And we have to either adapt to them or control them or, you know, we have to deal with them somehow. There has to be some activity, some response on our part. So that's the only religion I know that is not driven by the reductionist principle of trying to find one thing that explains everything. Huh? Or if shamanism has discovered the one thing that explains everything, it's that everything changes all the time. <laughs> some quickly, some slowly, some in between. That's all we can be sure of. Everything else, all other patterns that we notice in the manifestation, in the phenomena, are transitory and provisional only. That's all we can be sure of. 
But the other schools or views want to boil things down, you know. They like the concentrated stuff. <laughs> that there is one thing, one God, or one truth, or one view, or one methodology, or whatever it is, that solves all problems. So, I've begun to question this drive toward simplicity or reductionism as I think it's something it has gone out of hand. I think if we're analyzing something, it's good to have a simple model. But we have to be aware that it's a model. It's only an approximation. In religion, we could say it's an image, it's a dream that we want to achieve. A perfect world, a perfect body, a perfect relationship, or whatever it is, in some eternal perfect world. Well, where does this dream come from? Huh? I think everybody has somewhere in their mind or heart the dream of, you know, like the perfect tropical vacation. You go to this place and there's soft waves and it's nice and warm and, you know, there's a cool breeze blowing and it's perfectly comfortable. And, you know, some soft guitar music playing in the background. <laughs> And it's springtime. We want that eternal springtime or that eternal summer. You know, there's even a movie called The Eternal Summer, The Endless Summer, when same thing, about these kids going surfing all over the world, following the summer as it goes around. So anyway, we all want this some part of us deep down. Look at the popularity of Tarzan. Huh? Tarzan, the character was created over a century ago and is still very popular all over the world. Whoever owns that franchise is raking it in, man. <laughs> because everybody has this dream of this tropical paradise. Where does it come from? I think from my own personal investigations that it's like wired deep down somewhere in their genes. You know, they're, they're finding out more and more about DNA and how it's encoded. And it actually holds a tremendous amount of information, uh, much more than just the simple gene genetic code, a code of amino acids, four different acids. Um, that, that that can express <clears throat> because it's a binary, that's a binary code of four digits, which means only 64 possibilities. But in the patterns of the gene expressions, there is a lot more information encoded. And anyway, we're finding out that there's a lot of stuff in there, including the entire genomes of ancient viruses and stuff like this. Crazy, huh? So anyway, somewhere in our DNA, somewhere in our deep being, there is encoded this dream. And now, one of the interesting things about the mushrooms is that they give you access to the dream space while fully awake. So experiences that normally could only happen in dreams and then be forgotten upon waking can be remembered. You can take them out of the trance state and remember them and analyze them and think about them. And that's what really experienced uh, mushroom users do. They don't take it all the time. They only take it on special occasions. It's like a ceremony. 
And then they go back and they go, go into their own dreams and look at them. And this can take, you know, weeks or months. So it's not like they take it every day. <laughs> but they do, when they, when they do take it, recall and remember as much as possible. And even ask the mushroom questions during the experience and get her views, <laughs> the goddess. And the thing that they report, which is very interesting, is that the images and the places and the events that happen during the mushroom trance, and, and we're assuming it's similar to ordinary dream time too, it certainly is for me, that they have no actual location. Huh? They have no actual uh, analog in the real world. They're completely fabricated. Although they may, may recall or, you know, uh, remind us of experiences that we've had in life, still they can't be identified to be any particular place. So where are dreams anyway? This is a deep question and one that I don't have any answer to. And the ones that I have read by others or heard from others are very unsatisfactory. Because how do you explain the originality of the visions and dreams during uh, the psilocybin trance? See, how do you explain if they don't come from our memory, which would be the case if dreams were some expression of the subconscious, a la Freud, but they come from an entirely different source because we can't identify them, we can't um, link them with any of our previous experience. So where do these dream or trance or hallucinations, you know, if you want to call them that, these images come from? It's an unanswered question. It's really an unaddressed question. But anyway, prominent among these dreams is the dream of a tropical paradise, where one is completely safe, does not have to wear clothes, is with friends, or a supportive community of some kind, where the living is easy, you know, it's easy to find food. There's lots of leisure time to go poking around and checking out, you know, like the local mushrooms. <laughs> See, this is the environment that humanity lived in a long time ago. And almost every religion has a story or an origin story or so of our beginnings and there's some kind of Eden, there's some kind of paradise, some kind of heavenly place that we got kicked out of. I mean, this is so common in the, in the uh, origin stories of the world religions. I, again, can't think of a single exception. Uh, we don't really know <laughs> and we'll never really know where we came from exactly. Huh? But because the question is there, so many thinkers and philosophers and religionists and preachers have offered up so many different stories of how it all got started. It's almost certain that they're all wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of value in these stories, especially the, the Vedic stories, my God, you know, the Puranas and the, and the Yogas and the Upanishads and the Itihasas have so much good value in them, but we have to resist the urge to take them as absolute. We have to look at them as metaphors. Why? Because a literal truth is very hard to transmit 
through a long period of time. It, it's much better to put the truth in a story that illustrates or exemplifies it because people love stories. They like to sit around the campfire and hear the old stories, huh? Grandpa talks story to us. <laughs> so stories are memes that have much greater survivability than literal truths, especially about spiritual life. So they're put in the form of stories and they come down to us in these scriptures. But the trap that we have to avoid, I mean, maybe some of them are historically true, but it's almost certain that 90% of them are just stories, made up stories. And that's okay. If that's what we have to do to preserve our memes, to pass down our uh, genetic thinking, uh, that's what we're going to do. But at the same time, where do they come from? Where does the urge to create these stories come from? And I'm thinking that it comes from this inborn drive, this tension, this urge, this, this desire to attain this ultimate environment, this ultimate dwelling, this beautiful place, this paradise. Uh, so how we can do that is what shamanism is all about. And, you know, whether the uh, given stories in the scriptures are true, literally, or whether they're just speculations or metaphors for some deeper truths that have to be left unsaid because they're too deep and difficult to describe in language. Well, that's not something that we have to decide. We're not the judge and jury. Who are we, you know, to say which one is right or wrong? But we can investigate all of them and use all of them and extract the truths from all of them and then put that into the mix master of our minds and try to explain our existence where we came from, where we're going, what we're doing here. Huh? Why do we even exist? <laughs> These are the questions all of us should be addressing in the most unbiased way possible. And that leads to real progress. You'll see. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.